event uh, webinar of the this evening is that with the title of PAM Digital Series PAM uh, Facade Design Simulations and Sustainable Design Approach in, Ar in Architectural Design Studio by Mr. Azari bin Mayasir. Okay, a quick preview, a quick uh, background of Ms. Che Azari. I think many have would have uh, known Che Azari previously, uh, those who study in UTM. He was born in 1977, uh, married, uh, been in the UTM, a senior lecturer in UTM since 2002. So been there for many years. I think just a cut, uh, just a, a brief. Uh, it's been um, uh, uh, won many awards and honors received by him. Anugrah uh, 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 best presenter, and quite recent is the uh, ITEC 2018 gold medal awards. Um, Yes, 2002 until up to this, this date. Okay, without further ado, uh, I think uh, it's going to present a very, very interesting topic, so very relevant, not just for the uh, students, I think in the context of students, but also for the uh, practitioners. I think a lot can be, can be, uh, uh, can be learned uh, today from your, from your sharing. I think without further ado, uh, the floor is yours. Mr. Azari. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, moderator. Um, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, my name is Azari Mayase. Uh, as mentioned uh, by the Chairman, uh, I'm, the, I'm a senior lecturer in Faculty Alam Bena and UKO in UTM. Um, so today I'm going to give a bit of uh, sharing of what we've been doing in UTM, which I think is something that we can uh, learn together. So I'm going to just share my screen. Uh, OK, um, can you guys see the full screen of the slide? We don't buy full screen. All right. So OK. Um, <clears throat> The topic that I want to discuss, I want to share uh, with you guys today is about uh, facade design simulation um, as, a, as a sustainable design approach in architectural design studio. So the talk today is going to be about the design studio, what we're doing in uh, architecture schools, uh, particularly in UTM. And there's this approach that we are always going towards uh, sustainable design. But the, uh, th there are a bit of tricky things that has been happening that we observe uh, when the students develop their design. So we decided to devise a slightly different approach. And this is something that we want to share. Um, so today, the agenda is basically very simple. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction, I'll talk about case studies on how uh, my students have done their, their research, and then their, how they develop their design strategies and how we want the students to proceed in their studies, in their, uh, in their design development. <clears throat> so a little bit of introduction. So facade design uh, is frequently one of the last things uh, young designers would treat. So you know, because a lot of young designers, they are very eager. Once they get the project, they're just going to start doing the uh, site planning and then they start doing the messing and so on. But interestingly, it is also the very first thing people see about the design. So there is a dilemma here. The things that you spend the least time is the first thing that people will see. And you can guess what's the outcome. It's usually a little bit crappy. So usually what the students do, this is the common thing, um, designers will approach uh, design from top down. So they, they get the project, they, this is given by, uh, by the lecturers or the, the, the brief. And this actually is a habit that continues all the way into practice. So once they graduate, they start the project, they start looking into the uh, site plan and start doing massing of an empty site and stuff like that. So what they do is usually they take this particular site, for example, so they just uh, minus the, the setback and then eventually starts uh, the building for massing. Uh, let me switch on my pen, okay? <clears throat> 
So young designers tend to spend more time uh, on the ideation and messing, but not on the detailing of the building. So as you know, uh, a lot of experienced architects, uh, they would spend more time on the building facade because they already know about what they want to do. They have an idea uh, in their head and they just need to put it on paper. But young designers, they don't do this. They, they just look at the plans from the top down view. So most of the time, they spend less than 10% of their time in developing the facade, testing the building performance and deciding the overall outcome. So all of this, less than 10% of their time. So most of the time, just, you know, talking about their ideas, their design and stuff like that, which, but not on the important part of their building. They don't test the outcome of their, their, their design. So what we do in UTM, particularly in our master's, uh, master's design uh, studio, which is a part two. This is a LAMP part two uh, program um, under the Sustainable Technologies Group. So this is a group that focuses on uh, sustainable technologies. So what we do is that we tell the students to focus on designing the skin of the building, testing its performance against elements such as daylighting, glare, thermal comfort, ventilation, and so on. So we tell the students, you don't just think about the big things, think about the small things. Because if you want to talk about sustainability, you can't just talk about the big concepts. You have to understand how your idea is going to be implemented in the design itself. So this discussion focuses on aspects of daylighting. Okay. So software that we use, because uh, this is a PAM digital uh, talk. So basically it's natural that we want to talk about the focus or, or, or on the tools that we use. So my students, they use uh, AutoCAD 3D, SketchUp, Rhino, Revit, and a plethora of others. And then they also use daylighting simulation software, mainly like uh, Vlux, Daylight, IES virtual environment, Ecotech, uh, Diva plugin for Rhino, Open Studio for SketchUp, and so on. So most of my students in this exercise that I will show you, uh, they have been using Vlux, which is a free software that they can download on the internet. So how we approach this is, first of all, um, we do a case study. We go to real buildings, buildings that have been built. So for example, this is a study done by Aymanuddin, uh, a Crescendo International School uh, in, in Ulutiram, in Johor. So what they do is they have to construct the 3D model of this particular building. So they gather enough information, constructed uh, the 3D in Revit or AutoCAD 3D or something like that. And then they, I tell them to speak find a specific section of a building. So in this, uh, in this exercise, they focus on the main facade, okay? the glass facade of this particular building. So what we want to do is we want to simulate this. Does it really work? I mean, all this, um, all these shading devices, does it really work in terms of making the room more comfortable or you know, reducing glass and something like that? So this is the plan. So they get it, the plan. Uh, Ayman Udin focuses to simulate uh, the auditorium and also the library. So these are the two spaces that he has selected. So he went ahead and tried to simulate this particular software, uh, sorry, this particular uh, facade using the software. So um, they try, he tried to actually just emulate everything. So there is a, a random vertical pattern which the actual um, facade uses and there is a tinted glass level and then also the steel frame so these are the assembly of the facade that he has or, uh, that building has so he uh, he modeled the all the uh, facade and then eventually simulates it so this is the initial reading what i tell them to do is first of all before you simulate go there and get the actual reading so using um re, uh, uh, devices, he actually gathered all the information on the actual reading on a particular time. So 9 a.m., 12, and also 4 p.m. taken on February, uh, February in 2019. So this is the actual reading. So he tested out using this simulation. So this is simulation using Vlux, trying to gather all the, the information that he could and see if he actually managed to gather the right reading. So this is calibrating uh, process. So once they, he has calibrated the process, uh, making sure that all the readings are correct. 
So what we wanted him to do is to actually figure out, okay, so we have warehouses, home theaters, archive, which requires elimination of 150 lux. And then we also have office uh, and also study library, which requires around 200 and 500 lux. So this is set, this is given. So we know that for these spaces, we are required to actually achieve somewhere uh, in the close vicinity of these numbers. So he starts to experiment. He tries to change this, the elements here, uh, tries to change the element so that we can see um, the difference from this. So this is a 25 millimeter thick tinted glass and he changed it into a 10 millimeter thick uh, tinted glass. Okay, the reduced intensity from the glass from 60% transmittance to 90% transmittance. And then he simulates it and try to see whether he can achieve the right lux reading. So this is 148.4, this is 244.6 at 12 p.m. and then 208.7 lux at 4 p.m. So it gets closer and closer to the ones that he wanted to do. So basically through this simulation process, um, I'm being tested out all these various kinds of reading in order to try and get the best outcome for this particular space, which uh, for This, uh, this is about uh, 250 lux, that was the target. So as you can see here, the lux is actually 376.07. So now the task is to what can you do? What can you make or improve better? So instead of the random pattern, he converts it into a more regular pattern. Okay, so the idea is to, to see whether if you do it this way, does it help? Does it improve the daylighting in these spaces or not? Okay, so he tested it again. Okay, during this time, he saw that there are some changes in the reading. So this is now 191.5 lux which is at 12 p.m. and also 168.9 lux at 4 p.m. So this is for the library. And then for the auditorium, you have a little bit more control here. So you can see that even by the rendering itself, you can see the range is about 250. So there are lots more green in this space. So basically you have a better lighting without having to use any, any internal light and so on. Okay. So from his study, he saw that uh, there is an improvement, uh, improvement one uh, that he, the changes that he did. So using tinted glass with reduced thickness and new material reassignment on randomized vertical pattern strip actually produces a better outcome. So this is the one that he chose. So from this example, you can see that um, you can see that the students can understand that it's not just about doing things. It's about uh, it's not just uh, sorry. It's not just about claiming things. For example, I want to introduce this new type of uh, shading device and it will shade my building and make it better. In our master's program, we tell them, prove it. If you say it can make it better, prove it. By simulation, using the software, show me exactly how much improvement that your building is going to provide. So it's not just saying big things, or oh, this is going to be better for the building and stuff like that, which is a lot of people do. We, we go on the science part, okay? Stop being a politician, start being a scientist. Now you have to prove and show us that this, this particular uh, model is better uh, than the rest of the models, yeah? So another study uh, conducted by Li Xunxian uh, in University of Reading, Malaysia. So she did this study as well um, on the classroom of this particular building. So you can see that the sharing devices are there. Just uh, ada banyak lumpung-lumpung kosong tu, just uh, gaps. So basically, it probably too much glare, yeah, too much glare in the classroom. So you can see that that she has noted that. So she wants to introduce different kinds of shading device. Okay, so this is the existing facade. So she has several new elements: um, horizontal facade, vertical facade, and also egg crate facades. Um, each of them have different depth. So she has introduced 300 mm and 600 mm depth for each of those. So she wants to see if can this be uh, you know can can you test this out and whether it is better or not. Okay. 
So this is the simulation result of the existing facade. Okay, and this one is the horizontal fin and also vertical fin. So I'll just go through a, a bit. And then she also tested out the horizontal fins of 300 mm and then horizontal uh, fins of 600 mm and also try to check on the other elements as well. So you can see that glare at seats near the window is slightly better than the 300 millimeter depth. Glare on the whiteboard area is considerably reduced, which is also very important because as you know, in our classrooms, when you use whiteboards, if you have glare, then you can't see what is written on the on the whiteboard because as opposed to during our time the the old school people using blackboards we have little problem with glare but nowadays whiteboards lots of problem okay so of course she also simulated on the eight crates uh, on different depths of eight crates and then to see that the light are more uniformly distributed throughout the interior space uh, with using the same 300 millimeter depth Okay, but for the 600 millimeter depth, uh, the overall is too dim to be considered. So she rejected that one. So this process is basically testing out, figuring out which one is better, which one or not uh, is not. So we want the students to actually sit down, think about these real world solutions. Yeah, it's not just about having fancy buildings, beautiful designs, and all that. And also, it's definitely not about claiming big things, but have no chance to prove it. So here, we tell the students, you go and study on real world buildings and try to make small changes. The, the changes aren't big. They just only manipulating on the facade itself. So after that, um, they study, they come up with a proper solution and figure out the strategies. Okay, now I will show you three strategies that my students have done on various different uh, buildings. So hopefully this can um, show you a glimpse of what we're doing in our master's uh, design studio. Because um, in, in UTM, we have three main focus. We have the social culture focus, you know, focusing on the social culture elements, uh, social issues, uh, heritage, and so on. And then we have the urbanism group, which focuses on urban development, uh, sustainable, de uh, sustainable urban design, and so on. And then we have the sustainable technologies group, which is in which is my group, where we test things out. We simulate uh, building performance. We test for GBI and so on. But for this particular group, we just focus on one very simple thing, which is how to deal with daylighting. But we go deep. We just we don't just address daylighting. We test it out and we figure out what is the best way to produce this particular solution. Okay, in order to address the daylight issues. So here, uh, a study by Ahmad Shahir, uh, sun responsive facade achieving optimal rates of sunlight for institutional building. Okay, so this is this this was his design. So this is basically the final outcome. Of course, the facade isn't new. Okay, this is not some ingenious facade that he came up. We are, there are lots of precedent studies taking from other buildings and all that. But as what most students usually do, they just take. Uh, from a precedent and then just put it in the building. So when this particular student proposed this, I said, no, you have to prove that this thing works better than all the other facades that you, you have chosen. So the student have to go through the process that I mentioned just now. Not only they need to design the building, they need to design the facade as well. And then put the facade on the building and test it out whether it works or not. Okay, so it's a bit more challenge than normal design development, but of course, this is very important because this is part of their thesis. So the student, of course, did some studies uh, on the materials, tried to figure out what's the best way to do it, uh, whether he wants to consider lightweight, and of course, the other issues like uh, climate, Malaysia has lots of rains and stuff like that, so uh, he already covered on that one, uh, I, want to, I don't want to focus too much on that one, just to focus on the daylighting issues here, so he wants to do something that adaptive to the sunlight. So basically you can control uh, whether you want it fully open or maybe half open or fully closed. So the idea is if it's too bright, okay, you can control the facade so that it closes down. And then if it's too dark, then you can open it up. So that's the idea. Um, of course, his idea is to have this totally motorized, computerized that people don't have to control. But during the process, of course, there are many ideas that have to be detailed up. So he didn't he didn't manage to get to that part, but we have we, we get the idea. The thing is we want to make sure that this thing can be uh, 
can be built and pulled off. Okay, so um, this is the idea having the entire space open. So this is this entire building. So you can see that some of these spaces, sorry, some of these facade don't have any um, any sun shading devices. Only this part. Okay, only this part has shading devices because uh, early on he has already uh, determined that these are the areas that will be most exposed to the sun. So he did this simulation on the envelope. So in his first simulation, test it out if it's fully open. So you can see that the brightness uh, of the room is quite large here at 9 a.m. and it becomes brighter and become very bright uh, at this point. So as you can see, uh, 1000 lux, uh, sorry, rate is 1000 lux. So that is very high. Okay. So, um, and then of course he tested out on half. So you can see that the, the brightness is being controlled at 3 p.m. Now the reason why we pick 3 p.m. because this is a west facing facade. So we try to, to test it out so that we make sure that it is not too bright and the room is comfortable to be in. So because this is an institutional building, if I'm not mistaken, the space that he's simulating is the library or reading space of a library. Okay. So he tested out and then this one is the, the facade fully closed. This is from the interior part of the building. Of course, there are certain parts, as you can see here, there are certain parts that is deliberately left open. So it's not the entire facade, uh, the, the entire facade is not covering the entire, sorry, the shading device is not covering the entire facade. There are uh, areas of the facade that is actually not covered. So you can still have sunlight. Uh, coming in from that but even so here we can see that the the environment is quite controlled at around uh, roughly 500 lux so that's how basically he has improved because early on um, in his simulation he showed that uh, all different iterations for example the 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 uh, openings and also the pasal itself have different different readings so this one is the optimized one Okay, and of course, this is the rendering uh, for his final uh, design uh, submission. So we can see that, yes, it is a beautiful, it is a beautiful space, but for us, the most important one is, does it perform well? Okay, so if it's not, then all these beautiful pictures is nothing because we can see it all the time. A lot of students are just rendering this and showing off beautiful images because they have a good renderer and a good machine. But the point in this task is that not just it, is, it looks beautiful, it is also very functional. Okay, so this is his final outcome. The site was in KL. Another example uh, by Nurul Ain Nadira. Okay, um, on SOFO Pixel, so also achieving optimum sunlight for office complex. So for her project is an office, yeah. So slightly different approach. She already got the massing. She already identified that this is going to be her building. So there are lots of uh, cubes being assembled together. She also did a simulation in order to identify which part of the building will be most exposed uh, to the sun. So the idea is when you have too much exposure of the sun, so instead of blocking that sun, just install uh, solar PV panels. So she has already identified that all the red areas should be installed with PVs. So that's a good solution. Then the next issue is to actually uh, control the exposure on the yellow areas. So these are the areas that she is focusing on uh, when she designed the facade. Okay. <clears throat> so of course, certain areas on the other side of the building, she can uh, introduce vertical green walls and so on. So that's fine. Uh, so she introduced eight creek design. Um, this is the eight creek with four panels. And then this is eight creek with nine panels, um, different depths, 250 mm depth, and so 450 millimeter depth. So she tried to simulate it um, at 9 a.m., 12 p.m., and also 3 p.m., gathering um, different, different readings. So here she has around 236 slugs at, at noon and 205. Known for the 
450 millimeter deep. So here you can see that what, what was her target. So her target is around the green area, 250, uh, 188 to 250 lux. So that's the target that she wanted to achieve. So by installing the right kind of design at the right place in her design, then she can make sure that all the spaces get optimal lighting. Okay. Similarly, um, on different part of the building, this is now on the northwest facade. So just now is the northeast. So this is the northwest facade. This is the most critical one. So you can see here that um, at 12 p.m. it's 285.1, but at 3 p.m. it's severely reduced to 203.3 to 273.7. So the the thing about her layout, the, her orientation of the building is that she doesn't have one full facade that is facing directly towards the west or the east. So generally she has the northwest facade and also northeast facade and she also has southeast and southwest facade. So the angle of the orientation uh, basically makes her building uh, slightly more exposed to, to, the, to the western sun rather than just having just one full facade towards the, the west and the east. So this is the final assembly. So she determined that by detecting all, all the, uh, all the uh, facade that is being exposed to the sun, so she can easily determine where to put the right egg crate design. So this is the sun shading facade. So basically she can determine that, okay, on the northwest and southwest facade, let's use egg crate, nine panel, 250 millimeter deep and also the vertical lowers with horizontal overhang 250 millimeter distance, 1000 mm deep, okay? So here, you don't just guess, okay? We don't want the students to just simply guess, okay, this is where uh, I think it can be best, it can function very well and stuff like that. We tell them, no, you have to prove it, okay? So that when you put this particular facade here and you put this assembly looking like a roja, it's not just a simple roja, it is a design roja, okay? So you design this deliberately, so each piece here has to be there and not anywhere else. It has to be there, this has to be there, this has to be there. So everything is, is based on proper judgment. It's not just second guessing and then, you know, just trying to uh, assemble something that looks nice, but totally random. So this is not just that we tell the students to make sure that everything is put where it belongs, okay? So, of course, this is the final outcome. Um, currently, she's still finishing her thesis. So, this study was way back, uh, I think, last semester or last two semesters, okay? Now, moving on to the third uh, example that I have here. So, it's about um, flexible housing, okay? Achieving optimum sunlight using scaffolding facade system. So, again, also designing a facade, but this guy is uh, having a different approach. So he wants to design the uh, scaffolding to become part of the facade. So slightly different approach, but at, at, the, at the end of the day, we're still using the same method. You have to prove if you see scaffolding and all the materials that you use will help the building to become uh, more comfortable in terms of daylighting, then yes, please simulate and prove it. Okay, um, so basically um, that's the, up, the, the interior of his building. So actually this is exterior, so this is outside. Okay, so the spaces will be on the inside. This is generally the corridor. Okay, so he designed uh, four modules uh, of sun shading devices. So this is module one with two panels, module two with one panel, two panels and one panel. So you can see that the different elements that he has introduced. So this one is more opaque because um, it blocks uh, not just the sun, but also the view on this part. I will show you a bit later. And then this is one panel. So you can see that this is one whole piece okay, of the shading device. And this is the one whole piece of that shading device. Okay, So only small gaps where, where you can have the sun come in, but the bottom part will be open. So this is anything below here, these are open. Okay, anything below here, these are open. So you can actually have views and stuff like that. It's just the upper part of the uh, building is going to be blocked, as you can see here. So human is about this big, okay? That's the size of the 
human uh, for the scale. Yeah? So he simulates uh, all four modules uh, to test out uh, on the Passat facing uh, all angles, uh, north, south, east, west. But what I'm showing you is the west Passat. Um, at 3 p.m., which is the most critical time, so you can see that um, for model one, it's 220 lux, whereas the target should be around the vicinity of 250 lux. Okay, so this one is definitely too high. This one is kind of okay. Yeah, so this is definitely acceptable. So he already picked that, and this one probably a, a little bit too low. So when facing west, he has determined that let's use module three, okay, with two panels. Uh, on this particular part. So for the rest of the building, he already determined that, okay, we can use the module one, module two, and module four. So he starts to assemble everything together. Yeah, tried to do an analysis. So he determined that at 9 a.m., the lowest illuminance value for the facade that facing east is unit, uh, is unit that used module three, which is at 212.8 lux. Okay. So however, the illuminance module for value for module four are a little bit more compared to module three, at 216.2 uh, lux, okay? And then eventually he determined that uh, module three is selected to become the facade treatment that faces east and west. So this is where having proper backing uh, to your arguments can help during the development of your design because supervisors, especially uh, the jury, will want will need to be convinced that you, you can't just have uh, all this scaffolding, facade, and so on without proper justification because scaffolding tend to be temporary. What you want to do is something to be fixed, you know, for permanently throughout the life of the building. But of course, eventually it might not use actual, you know, scaffolding, but something that resembles a scaffolding, but more of a permanent nature. On that part, we leave that, uh, the design on that to the students. But what we want to know is whether his, um, facade modules actually work or not, <clears throat> okay? So he starts to assemble things together. So we tell the students, you, okay, now that your facade uh, design probably work, assemble it, okay? You can't just have conceptual sketches. You need to assemble it, figure out how everything comes together. So you have the interior space scaffold components. So basically it's not just the outside, the inside of the building also have the scaffold, but that's not critical to our discussion right now. So, and then um, basically he has the assembly where um, this will be assembled on that particular uh, bay. And then the scaffold will be assembled together. And then the exterior balcony scaffold component, which, which forms the circulation area for the building will be assembled last. So there are three layers that is going to be assembled on this side. And then as you can see here, the 15 millimeter vertical pins that is most uh, that is used to deal with um, uh, the west, east and west exposure are being installed on this side. So you can see this particular module is installed here. And then the more open module, this one, the 15 millimeter vertical pins passat type one with x brace railing is going to be installed on this side. So this is the outcome. So once everything is assembled, this is what it's going to look like. This one is exposed to the uh, east and west sun. Okay, so east and west sun goes that way. All right. <clears throat> so more details. So we get to look at we we get to look closer um, at his assembly. So we can see that. Um, everything has to be assembled properly. So again, we tell the students, you cannot just simply say this is going to be built like that. So prove it. So this one is detail A, figure out how everything is being assembled together. And this is detail B. And again, make sure everything can be assembled. Even if it cannot be constructed in the real world because it's too expensive, because it's too flimsy and so on. But for academic reasons, we test it out. We test it out so that we tell the people, we tell the architects that, this can actually be done, you know, but it's too expensive or it's too temporary. So let other people with a certain expertise to figure out, okay, I know how to make that permanent. I know how to make that uh, cheaper. So work together because the idea is here and then try to figure out a more permanent solution to that particular building. Yeah. So this is his final uh, rendering. Uh, um, Hanif also have not submitted 
So he is going to submit, inshallah, at the end of this month for his final thesis, and then hopefully he will be graduating, sama dengan uh, Nurul Ain Nadira just now. Okay, and this is his final outcome. <coughs> So uh, basically what I've shared with you um, is the approach that we have used. So we want the students to provide tangible and achievable objectives early on. So it's not just about claiming that this particular building can, can reduce heat, can create a more comfortable space, but it has to be more objective. I want to improve um, the, the lighting of this particular space from uh, 500 lux, which is too bright, I want to reduce it down to 300 lux. So if that's the objective, we want the students to show it. Show us that this particular design can actually improve from 500 down to 300. So we use computer modeling and simulations, which can simplify the process because previously we had to do everything by hand. Sometimes we can't have the proper reading because the, the tools are limited, but now we have access to all the computer simulations. And this allows designers to spend more time in creating iterations and addressing design challenges. So it's not just about doing one outcome and then simulate and show that it works, okay? Because in our exercise, we actually spend more time figuring out the iterations. So you can't just have one facade and test it out and then get the result and present it at the final semester. We have to present four to six iterations, okay? This is type one, type two, type three, type four, type five, type six, okay? We test it out. At the end of the day, type four is, works the best. So we can show uh, to the jury at the, end of the, at the end of the semester that I picked type four because I've already tested six types and type four is the best one. Okay, it's not just picking, just showing one final outcome. We have to show all the iterations and prove that everything works properly as we claim it to be. So the objective is not to create a solution that solves everything. Okay, this is also another important thing because of course we are in academia. We want to test out things. Um, you can't solve world problem. Okay, it's, it's not our task to, to solve world problem. Uh, but we can solve one problem at a time, just this small one, reduce glare, reduce illumination, you know, increase daylighting, reduce the use of artificial lighting and that sort of thing. Um, so we can use technology, uh, whether we can uh, make improvements, uh, innovations, uh, either in improving performance of the particular aspect that we want to study, lowering the cost, or just probably to make it more efficient, okay? So hopefully um, that would uh uh, give you a little bit of insight of what we're doing. Um, actually, I'm a bit forward in time. So I'll open for discussion and uh, hopefully we can do a little bit more of sharing based on the questions that you ask. So thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Chia Azari. I think that was very, very interesting uh, topic and uh, very detailed in a way from the student itself. And uh, loads of, uh, I think, uh, a lot of the fact that you mentioned, you know, uh, it has to be, uh, not just pretty drawings, but it has also has to carry meanings. Uh, whatever lines that you draw, that you uh, draw, it has to be uh, justifications behind that. Uh, um, is, is there any Chennai? Yeah, your, uh, I'm can back. Hear you? Can, can you guys hear oh, me? Okay, all right. Yes, yes. Okay, good. Okay. Sorry for the technical problems that happened just now. Anyway, uh, nice presentation by Mr. Azari. So we now open to the Q&A session for the, we open the floor for questions. You can write your question as usual in the Q&A box or direct to the chat box, or you can raise your hand if you want to uh, wish to speak directly to the uh, speaker, uh, Chi Azari. Okay. So interesting topic, uh, focusing on the niche segment of this uh, detailings, we touch on the facade itself. Um, shall I answer the question on the screen right now? Yeah, or? sure. Okay. We have the first question. Okay. Okay. 
Um, does the facade design include the engineering design for wind loading and water tightness too? Um, in our scope, we, we don't focus on that one because of course we, we have a theme, we have thematic. So basically what we want to do is to cater on daylighting. In fact, in daylighting, we have luminance and illuminance and glare and there are many other issues on the daylighting itself. The idea is to get the students in touch and understand the tool itself. Then afterwards, when they meet other tools when they when they use other tools for wind loading uh, ventilation water uh, fluid dynamics and stuff like that so they will be able to do it because it's not an alien thing that they have to learn from scratch so the idea that we try to focus on is uh, using one particular tool but go deep it's not just you know touching the surface um, but of course um, if we can find a software that simulates uh, wind loading, particularly yang free lah. <laughs> if, if it's free, then we can use it uh, immediately. In, in fact, we can implement it next semester as well. Vlux is free. That's the nice thing about it. So we can just take Vlux, download it, install, and immediately use it, uh, uh, try to get reading and stuff like that. Um, is facade design a requirement for the building plan submission to Majlis? I am not sure. So I'll probably book up for the architect word. Maybe uh, yeah, Azri can assist on this, this one through his experience. <laughs> I think if you have facade design, some of the facade design they have to get a specialist to design, to, to get input from the specialist. On the on the on the on the structural aspect of it, and also the detailing part of it. So normally, would the calculation would be main things on that. Okay, uh, I had one question before. I think since there's no other question, I had uh, one question to Chazari. I think whether these simulations. I think when you talk about simulations, that that uh, I'm sure student will try an error of their design, you know, you can't get uh, one times and get uh, right at one time. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, experimenting in terms of form, shapes, pattern of the device or the shading device. And hope, I'm sure that in a way, get a, a more better comprehension of what they're doing, for, especially on students. Uh, how is that goes well, or I don't know whether how is that goes with the students, whether that in a way put a student into more panning, you know, <laughs> or how is that go, you know, alamak tak dapat lah, tension lah, you know, then it goes back, you know, it, it, it delays the whole thing, they becoming, you know, or the, if the students are mature, they get, uh, you know, full fundamentals of the things that they want, uh, it helps them to make uh, a faster decisions in a way. So perhaps you can, by the way, this is not, I think it's good, not just for the students. I think it's, it's also good for the practitioners. I think most practitioners, you know, uh, in many aspects, perhaps they just focus on the commercial aspect. These are very detailed aspect, which is very, very good for the practitioners. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Architect Azri. So on the first question about the, uh, how do the students take it? Um, they, they, the students, they just like to do things in a different way. So the students nowadays, they just, they don't just want to do repetitive things. If they've done design in third year, they're going to do design again in fourth year and then again in fifth year. And then after that, they will be graduating and then doing the same design approach again and again. So when, when I give them a tool, a particular tool, uh, let's say a 3D, 3D printer, they, they're going to start focusing on that and figure out what can I do with this 3D printer? What, what, can I, what, can I, what can I use it for? So I let them basically play with the tools and see whether they can develop it or not. So this can only happen in, in master's level because I rely on their previous knowledge. Okay, They need to know how to design first because I don't want to spend time teaching them, okay, this is how you're supposed to draw restaurant. This is how you're supposed to do leave. I don't want to touch on that because there's only 14 weeks in a semester. Okay. So if they, if, if I still need to revisit about how they do, you know, um, think up or how they do toilet and stuff, I'm going to waste my time not focusing on the right things. So I tell the students, forget about that for a minute. Focus on the passat first, and then you develop, you test it out, 
then let everything else fall into place. Remember your training. This is like Star Wars. Uh, remember the fourth thing, blah blah blah. Remember your training because you dah hadir dekat sini from first year to fourth year. You are now at fourth year. Come on, you you must remember how to do site planning. You must remember how to do the services of your building. So I don't touch on that one. So I let the students focus on this for about 10 weeks just to dabble on this and then eventually reverse the process. So remember the first part of our, my presentation just now, students used to spend planning and also uh, space stabilization and stuff for about 10 weeks and then four weeks just to do the uh, facade and stuff. So I reverse this, do the facade for 10 weeks and then do the rest for just four weeks because they've done it before from first year to fourth year. So <laughs> there's no gado gado on that. And they will be doing this only for one semester. That, that's the thing lah, because we have 10 semesters of studies Apalah sangat, just giving them one semester to explore this kind of thing. So they'll be happy. Yeah, I think they'll be happy. But some of the students are here. If you are happy, you angkat tangan. <laughs> some of my students are here. So if you're not happy, come see me after this. <laughs> uh, sorry, what was your second part just now? Um, I lupa dah. What was your second part of the question? Sorry, your mic is off. I think uh, that that uh, explorations, the experimenting, the trial and error, whether that would 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 initially uh, delay the whole thing. So. Uh, yeah, but I think the benefit is better than than the the okay, the challenge lah, because I know they they will spend less time on developing their design, but. After this, uh, they will have one or two more semesters that they will go back into developing, developing full-fledged design. But at that point, they have already done a method to simulate. They already done this particular method, so they can just squeeze this part in order to actually pull off a better design afterwards. And basically, the whole idea is once the students know about this particular tool, when they graduate, going into the office, so when the office tries to attempt anything on sustainability, green building and stuff like that, the students are already aware. They know how to use the tools. So all they need to do is just get back, remember the training they have done in UTM, and then just uh, simulate the, the particular part that they need and hopefully become a beneficial member of the firm. Lah. All right, thank you, thank you. I think we had another question. Chen yeah. Aim, you would like to... Okay, then if not, then I just read this question. There, there is another okay. question from... It's okay, sorry, oh, okay. I, I asked it. Almost done. Okay, we have another question from AR Fazlina Rosli. Uh, she typed in the question in the Q&A box. So the facade simulation has always put importance on the comfort of its users inside the building. What about the microclimatic side of it? For example, the surrounding area uh, where flush facade buildings are known to increase surrounding temperature. And if one... It's spoon here. Oh, sorry. Okay, um, I, think, I think I get the idea. Okay. Um, all right. So it's about the microclimatic side of it. Uh, okay. So yes, we do consider that. Uh, not in my particular group, but another group. Basically, when they get into sustainable urban design development, because uh, in that section of the study, they'll be developing the buildings uh, in an urban setting. So they have to consider context. What happens if your building is reflecting? sun and glaring onto the next building what if the building next to you is overshadowing your building so they they have those aspects which is basically more um how do i say uh more contextual based okay in fact it also involves on how people behave around your building if you know your building is casting shadow uh on the left side of your building at 4 p.m then why don't you just do uh, an alfresco dining area at that part so people know because that area will always be shaded at four o'clock. So it'll be a cool place after they finish working at five o'clock, lepak the guys too, and design towards that. So we have another group that is focusing on that. So for my group, it's more inward looking and also more on an industry design bit. So a little bit of something that I want to share with you. The, the stuff that you that 
you see just now, the students' um, facet design, we are submitting that for pattern. So every semester, students will design new facade system. Okay, and we try to submit it for patenting. So UTM is backing us on this. So kalau kita submit that and then eventually get the patent. So students, before they graduate, they already have a patent under their name. So this basically gives them a bit of boost lah after they on graduate. Look, I have a patent. Which office in our eyes sekarang ni? So they kira macam selling point lah for our graduates. Thank you for that question. Okay. Thank you for the answer also, Jazari. So uh, we wait for any other question from the uh, attendees. We still have uh, five minutes of time. Yes. Uh, if not, I just uh, ask the simple session. questions to Jazari. Okay. If, uh, if I may, I think just to fill in the time. Sure. Uh, I, you know, it'd be interesting to do uh, an explorations via uh, tools. Uh, uh, simulations, you know, as against the physical models, you know, we use like we used to a student in the uh, in the in the nineties and the eighties uh, used to use where all of these uh, apps or uh, simulations uh, are not available. So we used to make physical models to explore to look at how things were. We do a lot of cuttings. So how do you see this in the future, whether uh, our physical model is going to be obsolete, uh, you know, in, in many forms that uh, those are, when you look at uh, um, in, in the previous uh, practice, practices, you know, as a, in the oldies. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> okay, um, physical modeling. Eh? Um, very interesting question because it used to be a debate in UTM. Um, we have the digital experts. Okay, I'm on the digital side, architecture and computing, and then there's the traditionalist, conventional architects that we always uh, bergaduh lah, loggerheads. Uh, I want more space for computing. They want more space for traditional, conventional methods and stuff. But right now, we eventually settle on a sort of a midway lah. What we usually do at first year is that you have to learn to draw by hand. The entire first year is dedicated on hands-on skill, painting, sketching, drafting, and all that. When they get into second year, we let them, you know, remember the training in first year where you need to have line weights, this need to be thick, this need to be thin, you know, all those different conventions. Now implement it in computing, you know, using AutoCAD and stuff like that. So they remember that the training is always use the conventional version first, and then you move on to the digital. And then eventually, when you get to third year, you choose whatever you want. You want to do digital, you want to mix, you want to do conventional, 100% is totally up to you. Now, the model making is exactly the same. We use the model making at second year. So they have to model everything by hand. So um, I think if, you, if you've been to my Facebook, I will always show the models that was constructed by that were constructed by the second year students and some of the model are basically material models they test what kind of materials uh, that is suitable for that particular building and some of them are for simulation okay uh, sorry uh, yeah daylighting simulation so they build a scale model on a certain size and then install camera inside it put it under the sun and test out how the shadow is being cast and stuff like that so we have that at second year it's just that when you go to upper years you know we don't expect you to model, you know, to build one model. We expect you to build six models. So of course that will cost time, cost money and so on. That's where the simulation software comes in. It's free. You can immediately do six. In fact, you can do 10, 20, it's up to you. And then you can immediately simulate test change and stuff like that. So the basic of this, uh, uh, the conventional modeling is still there. We need to have it. I cannot flourish if the students don't know what the what the purpose is i mean if they don't they don't know what is it for so we need to have that so basically we need each other lah. we we have the basics the conventional ones on during the degree during the part one and then when they go into the part two we test everything you know don't talk too much do so show us that this thing can be can solve a problem or whatever that they claim it to be 
So that's yeah. the approach. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you. Back to you, Chennai. Okay. Thank you, Chiazari and uh, yeah, Razri for providing all the questions because uh, I think the audience, uh, uh, maybe we can take one last question from the audience, from the attendees. Okay. So we have here uh, from the attendees who raised his hand, uh, Cik Muhammad Adi uh, Afan. Sorry, Cik Muhammad Arif Afan. Muhammad. Okay. Can the host uh, unmute his uh, speaker? Cik Muhammad Arif Afan, are you still around? Or else we move to our Mr. Cheng Huang. Okay, Mr. Cheng Huang, you can ask the question directly to Cik Azari. Mr. Cheng Huang. Hello, Mr. Cheng Wong. Are you still around? Do you wish to ask questions and to speak to Che Azari? I think that that's about it. Huh? Okay. So I think that's about it huh, for, for today. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Che Azari. And then uh, for the attendees and the participants, especially for the PAN members and LAN members, so uh, right after this, we'll provide all this sign-up code, okay? So you can see on your screen the sign-up code. You can fill it in, take, jot down the sign-up code and fill in the Google form that we provide. As you can see, it's appear on your screen now, the sign-up code 2022 PEMSO plus the QR code. So anybody who have the problem with the clicking the link, they can scan the QR code uh, on your screen. So allow some time for you guys to uh, settle this part, the sign up code. While that happened, uh, I wish to uh, thank all the members and participants for your continuous support to our programs, webinar series especially. So do bear with us this year because we have eight webinars uh, up until uh, April 2022. So the advantage is that you can collect your CPD points, and also you can conclude the CPD points requirement uh, as early as April 2022. Do follow uh, PEMSO official Facebook, PEMSO Southern Chapter, and our official YouTube channel, ARTV by PEMSO. Okay. You can check the link at the chat box that I just put it just now, uh, right now. Okay. Do support us. Thank you very much. And then see you for the next webinar, uh, inshallah, on the 22nd of uh, January. So do follow us. For the next webinar uh, series, it will be under the PEM Medical Series. Okay? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Chazari, and all our uh, secretary, PEM secretary, Chinai. Thanks. Okay, and all thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you for listening. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you all. Thank you, Chazari. Yeah. And then thank you to our partners, uh, uh, ANT and Mr. Chiao. Okay. So thank you also to the, our uh, crew members, the backbone of this uh, event. Thank you very much and Happy New Year. Do follow and subscribe our Facebook, like our Facebook, subscribe our ARTV, my PEMSO YouTube channel for updates and details. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a pleasant Salam. evening. Assalamualaikum. Stay safe, everyone. Bye.